2006, and today he's 92 and is still practicing law. So, therefore, Mr. Lee, being the inspiration behind this book. Okay, and also, uh, uh, we want to acknowledge the contributions of our. Son team from Rekka, my cousin and her son. Okay. And among them is also Professor Dean, uh, our chief editor and historian, Mr. Bobak Lim and Mr. Lim Hao Seng. Okay. And we also want to thank, KT, we want to thank the following for the generous grant, National Heritage Board, Singapore Chinese Culture Centre. Singapore Federation of Chinese Clan Associations. I especially want to give my gratitude and thanks to Kerr Lao Tzu, who is known as Kerr Wu Lin, or Mr. Kwa Bak Lin, who is the chief, chief editor and historian, and also uh, Mr. Lin Hao Seng, uh, is also the historian and editor. And also welcome Mr. Ronnie Tan, he is a representative and descendant of Mr. Tan Tok Seng. Okay. Uh, welcome. Okay, now uh, there is also a credit which I must give to Miss Stephanie Ng. She drew this uh, picture of our Pagoda building which we had to vacate in 2010. But she's here today. Stephanie, can you stand up? Now, she, she and a group of friends called the Urban Art uh, Sketches. They were at a, uh, they were browsing along Fellow uh, Ice Street and they did this sketch of this building, which is our former building, which we were there for 160 years until we had to give it up. Okay. So thank you very much, Stephanie. Now, how did this journey start? In 2012, this gentleman called Roy Tan, he was clearing out his house because he was going to migrate to Australia. And he found this bunch of documents. One of them you see over here, which is the rules and regulations of King Tech Way, written in 1831. Now, they, it's a wonder that this uh, document survived so many years and in 2031, we'll be celebrating our bicentennial. And Kate Tingwe is actually founded in 1831, which is just 12 years away after the founding of Singapore. Now, I'm also very amazed at how these people could have survived all these years in the attic in Malacca, in such a uh, terrible climate of Malacca. Now, also, Okay, uh, what you can see here is Mr. Roy Tan, the direct descendant of Mr. Stan Kok Tiao, who was one of the 36 founders of King Tik Wei. Now, he brought these uh, documents, some of them he brought in, in uh, 2015, and about three years later he brought the other half. So I was very anxious to get it uh, from him because um, um, a friend of mine called Ku Yi Hoon, who is here today, I think, she identified it as uh, documents belonging to Kei Ting Wei. Now, as you know, as uh, straight born Chinese Babas, we are not good at Chinese. So, when we look at the documents, we say we don't know, we don't understand. They know Chinese say put on. So, we don't know anything. So, we have to rely on friends who can understand Mandarin and say these are documents from Kei Ting Wei, dating back to the 1831. So I said, wow, this is, the, this is the thing that we were looking for all the time. We thought these documents were lost to eternity. Now, finally after we found them, we said, oh, maybe, maybe, just maybe we could write a book. So, but we were looking for a 
translator. There was none available. All the translators would say was, well, I think I can do only 60%. The rest we have to look for a professional translator. So we went around peddling the documents to professors, researchers, Chinese educated friends, etc. and we found nothing. So finally, came National Library Hall. Now, they gave me a call one day in 2021 and said, uh, can you come for a meeting? So I said, what is it for? I said, uh, just come for the meeting. So I said, okay, we'll come. So after some discussion, they said, oh, I uh, understand. They, uh, they said, we understand you want to donate some old documents to the National Library Board. So we said, okay, fine. And they, I said we have to get translator first. So this project sort of got stuck, also partly because of the COVID pandemic. And finally, I got uh, to meet uh, Kurt Hauser, the professor um, who everybody knows, Robert Lin, and he advised me to get it translated. So he is a man with many talents and many connections. So he got it translated for us. Of course, a, quite an expensive fee. And, um, oh, of course it's worth it. Okay, but uh, of course it's uh, put a little dent in our finances. It can take away. Right? Now, when we look at it, look back now, we we say it's a case of Yenfen. Because Mr. Lim Hao Seng and Mr. Kwa Pa Lim were young Nanta students or graduates who were looking for some project to write about in 1973. So they were browsing along Telai Street and they came across this pagoda looking building. Sort of a, they said maybe it's a secret hideout for some people. So they approached the Hokkien Wei Kwan and through connections through Mr. Tan Yong Siong, the late Mr. Tan Yong Siong, they managed to get into King Tek Wei and get information. And that's how they started writing about King Tek Wei. But they were not the first writers to write about King Tek Wei, as I'll show you later. Now, also 50 years later, in 2023, we have the two of us and Mr. Lim. We got together to write this book, gather the documents like these rules and regulations here and other law books which document the activities of King Ting Wei from about 1850s up to the 1910s. So we managed to gather a very good picture because what we had before this was a group of documents which was only in English and which we could only understand how our ancestors were doing the activities and how they carried out and how were the principles and the virtues and their operations. So we got a real insight, a real window to the past by through these documents. And I was very, very glad that this uh, translation was completed successfully. Now, also the reason why we wanted to get it done was all of us getting on in age. I'm already 69. Mr. Kwai in the 70s, Mr. Lim is already 82 I think, or 81. Um, so we said we don't have that much time. And of course, Mr. Lee Han Yang here was goading us to uh, get it done, get it done, you know. We don't have that much time. And also, the descendant who founded these uh, documents in uh, Malacca, he told me, uh, he said uh, his name is Roy Tan. Uh, his piece is here today. Norin Chan, Norin Chan. Yeah. Okay. Now, unfortunately, uh, Norin's uncle was, uh, or rather, grand uncle, Tan Jin Ho was your grand uncle? Yes. No, Tan Jin Ho my was. My sorry? grandfather. My grandfather. Your grandfather, yeah. Tan Jin Ho, unfortunately, came to Singapore on behalf of his corporate grandfather, who was Tan Chong Lek, one of our presidents. He came to Singapore to get documents for his father and unfortunately when he came here, the Japanese were here. 
So true and unfortunate this incident at the Sentry um, Point, he was arrested and he was taken up the lorry and never came back. So the father was literally born for the son until he died in 1947. Very poor thing. Okay? But these documents were kept in the attic to prevent the Japanese from finding out. If the Japanese had found these documents in the attic, the whole family would be wiped out. Okay? Now, as we were saying, uh, our gentleman, or Mr. Kwa and Mr. Lin and some other writers, were not the first to write about King Tingui. Now, you can see here a newspaper clipping from the Singapore Free Press of 1837. Now, it's mentioned here. The only brotherhood that we have or established here for purposes is, which is praiseworthy is the King Tingui. This was originally composed of 36 Chinese shopkeepers of the highest standing in the place and the object was to raise funds by subscription and donation to support the families of their number of as, un, being, being, uh, as became unfortunate in business. Each member paid on entering the sum $100 and a fund of $3,600 Spanish dollars was thus raised at once, which we understand was considerably augmented by donations and otherwise. So the building itself, the, the beautiful, magnificent Pagoda building, we had to give it up because we couldn't afford the, the renovation. And the Taoist mission, by a stroke of Yenford also, came to our rescue. They bought over the place, of course, at a not very attractive price. Uh, but I must commend Master Lee and Master Tan for working so hard to restore the building. Uh, Master Lee <laughs> and Master Tan. Okay. Now, we had a, a lot of good deal because Master Tan was my former primary school classmate. So it was a reunion of, of sorts and we all got along together. So the negotiations for the sale went, oh, went quite smoothly. Alright? So uh, thank you very much. You've already restored a public building, which is a national monument, back to its original splendor. Now, just to reiterate, many people have asked me, is KTV still a secret society? I say we're not secret, but we're just private, is all. Okay? Now, if you look at me, I don't wear a tattoo, huh? no tattoos, huh? okay? I don't wear a Hawaiian shirt, I mean Batik shirt, right? I'm not a gangster, I'm an accountant before. And uh, we are, KTV is, is registered with the Registry of Societies from 1890. Okay? We are dutifully also paying taxes. Now, uh, Currently, King Tingui still carries out the principles which were first outlined by our founders, 36 founders in 1831, and we still give allowances to widows, we give assistance to members in need, and also Chinese New Year, we give big amounts, and also when we had COVID, we gave an allowance of $1,000 to each member. And also, when in 2023, we have this high cost of inflation where prices kept rising we also help our members to offset the cost of inflation we give them an allowance okay? and we offer from time to time we organize during parties and social events and we are also going on a trip next year to uh, Japan all right now uh, we are also in my next slide we are looking at why did these uh, 36 blacker people set up King Te Kui, alright?
why they set up this uh, cake takeaway. Now, I'm quoting from a translation uh, which was done in 1918 of the original Chinese version. It says the promotion of right relationship between individuals, the awakening of a sense of shame, and the rousing of pity for the orphan. So, if we distill the values that uh, King Tewe stands for, it's basically filial piety, compassion, and morality. And uh, as uh, some of you have it, uh, for information, this translation was done in a very excellent fashion, but uh, by a Refugian scholar in 1914. We paid him 50 Spanish dollars to do uh, this translation. Uh, 50 straight dollars, sorry. And uh, he actually took liberties with the translation, which uh, Mr. Lim Hao Sing found. Uh, he, he's tweaked the, the, the translation a little bit. Okay? Now, when you look outside here, there is this Stanford Tunnel, which used to be known as. In the olden days, during Raffles' time, it was called Clear Water Stream. And there was a Banyan Creek. Oh, excuse me, there's a phone. Hi, <laughs> 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 right, Dominic, you can come up now. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Okay, now. So the story goes that he actually translated this uh, in this book here and he says, oh, uh, through eternity, you know, they, they write very flowery language, they say, oh, by the clear water stream and the banyan tree. So I checked with Mr. Lim Hong Seng, he said, do they say this in China, where they have a banyan tree? He said, no, 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 it's just his imagination. <laughs> So now in the book we have we have put put in the correct translation. Okay, now you can see the splendor of the old King Way. And this was taken in 1997 by Mr. Roy Tan. It was still looking good at the time. And now this is the new place. It's a little bit more modest, but uh, still serves its purpose. Okay, now this is a quotation from this one of the law books which were found together with this particular book. Uh, it was quoted by Mr. Sid Bontiong. Mr. Sid Bontiong was the second president of King Tegui. Now he said, the founding of King Tiwe by our 36 one brothers with different clan names aims to pass on good values to our children and grandchildren. We hope that future generations will prosper forever. Now, as we know, you can pass on money to your children and your grandchildren and your future descendants, but the money may just disappear. So my my contention is that you should always give good genes and not money. Now this is just a picture of the Singapore in the 1840s. It's a bit, uh, of course, uh, they've taken liberties. Uh, the and there's also a picture of the floor I Basin. Now you see the arrow there. There's the King Tingway building which was there. And this was uh, in 1879 when they first started the reclamation. So today, when you stand at Shenton Way, it's on reclaimed land. So in those days, when they came from China, they would take a boat from the ship, and they would land on the shore there. And the first thing they would do, they would run to the temple and say, Oh, thank you very much. Thank God I'm, I'm safe and I'm still alive. Okay. This is a picture of uh, one of the 36 founders. This is my great 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 grandfather. Unfortunately, we've not been able to locate pictures of the other 36 uh, 
founders. So this is the only picture that is available. And uh, the, uh, I donated this uh, picture to the NUS uh, Museum and they also did a uh, very nice, uh, as you can see, a nice restoration. And his name is listed in the founder's tablet on top. Okay. Now, uh, in, in the founder's tablet, uh, what name was missing? What name was missing? Instead of 36, there were only 35 on the founder's tablet. So a lot of people were curious and, and gossiping. Oh, why is what missing? So if you want to know why, buy the book. <laughs> okay. Uh, towards uh, my conclusions uh, about the reason why we made this book. Now, we want to record our history. First, history of our association. How did it happen, etc. From A to Z. We also want to help interest groups understand early Singapore. So scholars and any member of the public want to know how did they carry on their lives in early Singapore. This is how. This is what uh, avenue for for finding out. And we also want to help understand Chinese social behavior in post rival Singapore because uh, the rules and regulations, especially. We realize it's actually a code of conduct, right? Although it was very, very uh, prescriptive, and it contains a lot of uh, penalties. If you don't do this, you get fined four dollars uh, Spanish dollars. If you don't do this, you get caned five times and this sort of thing. But in reality, the our ancestors did not carry out those penalties. They were quite compassionate, even for some of them who did bad things in the association, all these things, okay, we'll expel you, okay? That's about it. So there was a lot of compassion, even at that time. And this, this uh, project is also to allow historians to do more research. Also, we will donate free copies to libraries of universities and schools, and even uh, in China, we will, there, the universities were interested in the stories of uh, King Tegui and we also want to uh, dispel the myth of Kong Si. What is Kong Si about? Okay. Now, question is, is King Tegui still relevant today? Some of our members say, well, not relevant, uh, you know, they don't do much, they give us money all the time, we don't have to give them, we don't have to pay subscription. Now and then we get free holiday, we get some allowances and all that. But I say no. We are still we still have a couple of good shop houses, we still get quite good rent. And from that, this is the way our we want to continue the tradition of King Take Way. And this is uh, the thing about self-help. We can't just depend everything on the government. We got to help ourselves stand on two feet. <coughs> so at the same time, we also want to pass down good values to our descendants. Right? The Confucian uh, values, hard work, thrift, filial piety, gener generosity of heart, family unity, all these are still relevant today. Relevant today as it was in 1831. Okay? So schools and when you, when you are in a team, play rugby or football or whatever, in the school, in the classroom, there's always this question of unity. Alright? Unity. And this is something we also want to promote. Teamwork, unity. Okay? Just like brothers, okay? like my brother is here, we are very brotherly. Okay, finally, we talk about the challenges of producing the book. Now, this is the interesting part, the challenges. Okay. First and foremost, the translation. Now, it's really mind-boggling when you look at the language. It's so flowery. They borrow poems and uh, sort of scripture from the old Chinese classics. 
So for anyone who is not tutored in the classical Chinese, it's a real challenge. And it was written in Minan Hokkien style. So if you if you are able to read, if, if you are able to understand Hokkien, you can just take the document and read it, and it will, it's going to come out something in like Hokkien because it's Hokkien. Okay. Now uh, also some of the Chinese characters evolve over time. So only experts who are good in calligraphy, they understand Chinese literature, and they understand uh, Chinese practices. They also uh, understand what is it like to live in those times. Then you'll be able to understand what, how difficult it is to do translation of these documents. And Mr. Kwa Bali used to complain to me, these documents have no full stop at all. <laughs> Every time you do translation, you have to try and figure out where to put the translation. Yeah? They just carry on writing, 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 there, just there, as if they're speaking. Now, there are also uh, two ancestral records because it's already almost 200 years since these documents were written. So we have had also difficulty tracing family trees. Right? We, we managed to uh, get some family trees from some of our members, but for the rest, they say we don't know anything beyond our great grandfather. Okay, and also I have to tell you there is no book index in the book because there's something like 250 names in the book. Okay, I'm still going through proofreading of the English edition, I'm still having a headache going through making sure that the, the, the Chinese character is correct and who is related to who. There are so many names. Now, finally, the highlight of this event is to donate these materials. We have all together seven books. One of them is uh, Jia Pu, uh, written by uh, Mr. Tan Kok Tiao himself was a partner of uh, Tan Kim Seng back in the 1850s. Now, uh, Mr. Tan Kok Tiao actually wrote, he actually asked someone to uh, write for him his uh, family uh, tree. So this person went back to China and did a family tree. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, the present generation of uh, Tan Kok Tiao descendants are in the, I think the 19th generation. Okay. Now, NLP has promised to, once, after this event, we are going to send the documents to the warehouse at uh, Changi, and uh, NLP will do preservation. Okay? And I've been told it will take some time to uh, film it in, preserve it, and uh, do whatever it takes to keep these documents in good shape for the next maybe few hundred years. Now, Doing this will allow any member of the public to go online and search these documents and understand yourself. Okay? Some of them may be descendants, like we have one gentleman here. He's a descendant of uh, Ang Chun Singh, one of the founders. Mr. Tan Man Wong, can you stand up? Yes. Yes. And, and another one of his uh, cousins. Okay? Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Ang also. Okay? Now they are related to the family of Tan Jiang Kim. Now Mr. Tan Jiang Kim married three sisters from the Ang family. Okay? Of course they met one after the other. <laughs> okay. Now uh, so let me conclude. By thanking you all for coming here today, for sharing with us your time, your effort, and we are very pleased King Tae Wei here. Uh, can also the other members of King Tae Wei who are here, can you stand up? Show us up. Ready? Trevor? Colin Sin? Now Colin Sin, his ancestor, he was the second president of King Tae Wei. Sit Bun Tiong. If you go to Tiong Baru, there's a Tiong Baru, uh, there's a uh, Bun Tiong Road. Bun Tiong Road. Okay, so look out. And there's also another one called uh, Chan Kuan. Chan Kuan. 
No chat gun. Uh, there's also a chat gun street in Jambaru. Okay? So, if you look around there, there's a lot of history there in Jambaru. Okay? So, uh, have a nice time uh, eating in Jambaru market. And I bid you all thank you very much for coming here today. Thank you. Raffles Professor for Humanities, Department of Chinese Studies, National University of Singapore, to say a few words about the role. Professor Dean, please. Thank you very much. And uh, many thanks to Mr. Khan for making all of this possible. Uh, and uh, thanks to Mr. Khan uh, and Mr. Uh, you know, for their wonderful work on this uh, really important text. This is uh, an extraordinary document that gives us incredible insights into the organization of early Singapore Chinese Brahmic society and uh, Singapore society as a whole. We're really uh, blessed to have this uh, document that's going to change our understandings in very fundamental ways uh, about the early society here. This, uh, as we know, uh, six volumes of uh, meeting records describing all of the procedures uh, of this organization. Uh, all of their uh, concern for their members, uh, the widows, the orphans, uh, the uh, less fortunate amongst the community, uh, and then a great deal of information about their decision-making process of who to bring into the uh, organization in each generation, and the, the moral considerations that they deliberated about, uh, the character of the, of the individuals that maintain a very high standard of uh, uh, moral characters throughout uh, the generations. Uh, all the, the details of their finances, of their ritual performances, they kind of a very active ritual life, uh, honoring their uh, uh, founding uh, 36, uh, 35, 36 <laughs> ancestors. Um, and uh, the society has continued to this day to be to play a very active role in Singapore and uh, serve as an example of the continuity of these remarkable associations that have um, had such a, a tremendous contribution to uh, Singapore society. I, I am so uh, excited to see this document in, in, uh, for the first time in, in, in this form, and uh, I really want to uh, compliment the NLB uh, for its incredible work in uh, encouraging uh, donations of this kind. Uh, we have almost a transformative moment here in the history of Singapore uh, with a great deal of uh, really important documents coming into the NLB, uh, business documents, uh, documents of associations of this kind. Uh, I think we're at the uh, a point where Singapore studies will be transformed forever thanks to the, the, the donors' uh, generosity and thanks to the uh, preservation efforts of the NLB. So I, I don't want to take up too much of your time uh, I've written a small preface for this book so I, uh, to explain some of the contents, uh, and I don't want to go over that uh, right now. I want to go to purchase copies <laughs> and, and, and uh, uh, support this uh, wonderful project. Uh, but I do want to say that, that this is a, a, a great turning point. I think uh, with this document, we can actually speak about tonight as a turning point in the study of Singapore society and the uh, beginning of a new era of Singapore studies. So uh, I'm really very delighted to have this opportunity to congratulate uh, all of the, uh, the hard work that went into the transcription of this incredibly complex document. Uh, very difficult uh, uh, philological work, very expertly done, and a uh, remarkable achievement in its own right. Uh, and then the uh, uh, material that Zubu, the, the uh, Jiaobu that's in there is also an extraordinarily valuable document. So I hope we can find more such genealogical records for even more of the uh, uh, founding families of Singapore. We're now into the, uh, I think, the eighth generation in some cases uh, of uh, Romney's uh, families, uh, certainly up there with thousands of descendants. So uh, we have the opportunity to uh, rethink Singaporean studies from, from these kinds of family histories uh, uh, back into the early early days of the founding of, of the, uh, Singapore. So, uh, 
uh, once again, congratulations to you all, and thank you. Uh, thank you for your generosity, uh, the generosity of, of those in your family to preserve this text. I think there are many more in Malacca. <laughs> so so I, I do hope that we can encourage even more. Uh, one of my students went there recently found an incredibly valuable uh, uh, documents. There's, there's a great deal of uh, even more to be discovered through the Peranican connections uh, in Malacca and Singapore. I think this could be the starting point, and I hope more and more people will follow your example and uh, donate more of these uh, materials so that we can amass a, a really comprehensive collection of sources for a, a complete and good understanding of Singapore society. Thank you very much. Chief Editor and Historian, uh, Mr. Lin Hao Sing, Historian and Editor, Mr. Ronnie Tan Kun Siang, the President of King Take Way, and Mr. Lee Han Yang, uh, Senior Member of King Take Way, Mr. Ong Jo Pong, uh, Chief Executive Officer of National Library Board, and Mr. Lee Shen Yeo, uh, Director of National Library. Pre-order, okay? So if you'd like to pre-order a copy of the book, 
you can fill up this card, and when you're done filling it up, please pass it to Jasmine. Jasmine's the lovely thing we have with her hand up, she's right in front. So we are done, just fill up the uh, fill up the card and hand it over. There's both Chinese version as well as English version for your choice. Okay, so thank you ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of today's program. We encourage you to hang around, chat, or to take photos, and I think there's still some refreshment there. So thank you, and have a good night. So sorry, there is one more video, one last video. I beg your pardon.